Okay. So uh, for this lightning talk, I wanted to uh, share a few things about um, using build root for uh, kernel developers. So uh, the subtitle is how kernel developers can finally solve the, the root file system problem. Of obviously, I'm going to explain what I think this problem is. So as far I'm, uh, as I'm aware, I'm still working for free electrons and we're still hiring. So not much change since, since uh, this morning, uh, hopefully. Um, so doing kernel development is absolutely awesome. I think we've had a great set of talks during those two days. Uh, but obviously, uh, a kernel without a root file system is kind of useless. I mean, everyone has, sees, has seen those kind of messages like kernel panic, you need a root file system, or you need an init application or something. So the kernel is really a wonderful world, but we still need this damn user space that like we, we really like to hate, but we need it. So we need to solve this problem. There are different solutions typically used by kernel developers to get a root file system to do uh, their testing because if you need to test a driver, you need user space application to like send network stuff or display graphics or whatever. So you need some user space applications. So you have multiple choices. You can use a complete Linux distribution, say, I don't know, Ubuntu or Fedora or OpenSUSE or whatever distribution you prefer. Uh, this is nice because it's readily available. Um, usually you're already used to some distro because you use it on your desktop, but it's quite large, so it can hardly use either init RAM FS, which is completely loaded into memory at boot time. You would hardly load a one gigabyte uh, root file system as an init RAM FS, so not very practical. It's not necessarily available for all architectures, and no, x86 and ARM are not the only architectures in the world. There is far more than that. And there were some people um, that were surprised to hear uh, alpha being mentioned, for example, but there are many more architectures that exist. And it's also not so easy to customize. Of course, you can install and remove packages, but if for one specific package you need to change the configuration, you would need to like rebuild it in some way and so on. It's not, it's, you can customize to some way, but it's not that easy. Another solution is to use a pre-built root file system, something that has some, probably been built some time ago or that you can find on some website, a, a, um, a root file system for ARM or x86 that has a bunch of tools. So it's usually relatively small can probably be used in, uh, as an initram FS because it's relatively small, but it's even less flexible. You can't even install more packages, remove them. It's just, you use it as it is and, and, and that's it. It's also not really available for all architectures. And last solution that you could use is a root file system built manually. You take BuzzyBox and then you build it. That's pretty easy. It gives you a small and usually relatively flexible uh, root file system. You can put it inside an initram FS, but it's quite some work to create, even if BuzzyBox by itself is quite small, but it's BuzzyBox is often not sufficient. Like if you want to test network, you will need a few applications to, to generate some network traffic, so display some um, um, well statistics about the network bandwidth and latency and that kind of things. Same thing if you do video or input device drivers or graphics driver or whatever. You need some other user space tools like I2C tools or USB utils or other tools. And of course, if you build something manually, it's difficult to reproduce for colleagues. So Definitely, there must be something better. And there is something that comes from the embedded Linux world that I think um, could be useful to other kernel developers as well, and not necessarily working in the embedded Linux space. So embedded Linux build systems are tools that automate the process of building a small, or not so much, but in our case, we are mainly interested in small ones, uh, Linux systems directly from source. So it's a little bit like cross tool ng is doing for tool chains. It takes different components of a tool chain and build them. An embedded Linux build system is going to do the same for a Linux system. So since it's all built from source, you have a lot of flexibility. You can adjust the configuration option for any of the components. You can rebuild for whatever architecture you need with whatever compiler optimization you want and whether you want software floating point, hardware floating point, or whatever you need, you can change that configuration. Those tools are normally used to build production embedded Linux systems, such as the one you have in some consumer devices or industrial devices. But you can also like uh, use them for more for to generate more testing oriented root file systems. Uh, so there are a lot of such build systems like Open Embedded, Yocto, that are quite famous. Also Build Root, which is the one I'm going to focus on in this presentation. PTXdist and a bunch of others. But if you've ever tried like OE and Yocto, they are certainly quite nice to generate build um, for production embedded Linux systems. But for kernel developers, they are quite hard to set up, long to build, and so on. Well, usually what the kernel developers want is get quickly a root file system that is just a few tools. And as Kevin Inmel, who actually reviewed those slides, said, he said, well, to me, OE fails the easy to understand, quick to set up test, and is no using build root because it can just generate whatever it wants quickly. 
I'm not, I'm not going, I'm not saying that they don't have other advantages, but for the purpose of kernel development, having a fast and easy tool to use is, is, is critical. So what BuildRoot can do is it can generate for you a tool chain, a root file system, a kernel, and a bootloader image. In this talk, I'm mainly interested in, in its capability to generate a root file system because we're going to reuse an existing tool chain, for example, produced by CrossToolNG or that you got from another place. Usually you do that once for all and once you have a working tool chain, you never touch it again. And the kernel is not something we're going to build with BuildRoot because we're doing active kernel development, so we want to just have our kernel and git tree and, and do our builds manually. What we really need is the root file system. It's a build system that's very easy to configure because it uses menu config or xconfig or any other things like that. So it uses kconfig, as Jan mentioned is in his previous presentation. It's really fast, so it builds a simple root file system with just BuzzyBox and a bunch of tools in a matter of minutes. So you don't have to wait for hours for the damn thing to build. It's easy to understand. It's just written in make and kconfig. So if you do kernel development, most likely you already know kconfig, most likely you already know make. So in fact, you already know how to use and extend uh, build root. It generates a small root file system. The minimal ones is in the order of uh, like two megabytes approximately uh, for just a, um, a small buzzy box file system. And beyond just buzzy box, there are more than 1,000 user space libraries and applications that are already packaged. Like if you need SQRC tools or some network um, bandwidth monitoring tool, there are already a lot of things that are available and you just have to select them in the menu config. Many architectures are supported, so I won't name, name them all, but most of the uh, common ones are available and also some more exotic ones. There is a very active community. Uh, producing regular releases. Every three months there is a release uh, that is published and the community is quite active. There is almost like, almost 2,000 mails a month these days on the mailing list, so it's very active. And it's used by many embedded uh, system makers and one of the uh, probably most famous example is that Google is using BuildRoot to build the embedded Linux build system that uh, powers their Google Fiber boxes. So it's a project they have in the US to deploy f um, fiber network um, uh, for homes and give uh, internet access and TV and so on in, in some cities in the US. So it's still an experimental project for Google, but they are using uh, BuildRoot to generate the system in those boxes that are quite similar to the boxes we have in, in, in France for internet access. So the usage of BuildRoot is really simple. You run make menu config and then you have a bunch of things to configure. Uh, in our case, in this specific use case of BuildRoot, we're mainly be interested in, in, in selecting, of course, the target, like which architecture, which CPU variant. The tool chain, we'll most likely be using an external tool chain, so a tool chain that already exists, as opposed to asking BuildRoot to build its own, which would take quite some time every time we, want, we wanted to do a build. Uh, there is a little bit of system configuration you can do, and I'm going to give some details about that, like on which serial port should um, a build root be showing um, a, um, a login or uh, some other con configuration of the, uh, the system as a whole. And then the most interesting part is obviously the target packages, like which application you want to be, or your libraries you want to have in your root file system. Once you've defined that, it's stored in the .config, it's all regular kconfig stuff, so it's very easy to use for people who are used to do kernel development. You run make, and then it builds, and in output images, you have a root file system image in different formats, depending on what you've configured here. It could be a tarball, it could be a nxt2 image, or whatever you want. So in, when you do kernel development, I believe the init RAM FS is really, really useful, because your root file system is entirely in RAM. This is nice because it means your kernel does not depend on any kernel driver to access the root file system. It does not depend on the network, it does not depend on storage or anything else. So uh, back um, about my presentation this, uh, this morning on ARM stuff, when you do a very basic bring up of a platform, you usually don't have access to anything except memory. So having the capacity of mounting a root file system and accessing a bunch of tools is very nice. Then even when you get more and more drivers, it's still very useful because you know that all your applications and your entire root file system will be not affected by whatever is going on on all the drivers. So like, for example, if you do NFS mount, uh, it's nice, of course, but then it depends on the network. So if you want to do some network testing, it's kind of affecting the testing you're doing. While with um, an in initram FS, it's really, well, as lightweight for the system as possible. But since it's all loaded into memory at once when you boot, and you're booting very frequently due to you doing kernel development, uh, most likely you're not going to do a perfect driver from the first try, 
So it has to be small, so it gets loaded um, quickly. And build root abil ability to generate really small file systems is very useful in, in, this, um, uh, in this kind of use case. So if you want to use build root for that specific use case, what you can do is taking an example of a Cortex-A8 platform, you go in menu config, and basically you don't have that much to configure. You just say, OK, I'm using the ARM architecture. I want to use the ABI HF ABI, which is the ABI that allows to use hard hardware floating point uh, to make it quick. It's a little bit more complicated, but that's generally the idea. And you say, I have a Cortex A8 ARM. Then in toolchain, you say, I want an external toolchain, and Buildroot will automatically uh, select you a default one, which is the Linaro toolchain, uh, which is perfect for uh, EABI HF uh, Cortex A8 code generation. So that's a perfect match. Then in system configuration, I'd recommend selecting the dev TMPFS uh, solution, which instead of requiring static device nodes, uh, get the device nodes automatically created by the kernel. So it's not the default on all desktop distributions, and we, we've actually made it the default in build root just a few days ago or last week or something like that. So it's not becoming the default. And also ensure the serial port is, is correct so that it's displayed on your, um, on your serial port. And for file system images, you just select the CPIO format, which is the one used by the kernel for uh, initRAMFS usually. So it's really just a, like, I don't know, seven or eight options to select. You run make, and then after like two minutes and 46 seconds of build time on, on my laptop here, which is two years old, so not necessarily the best thing, but still quite nice, uh, you have a CPIO uh, image available. It's three meg uncompressed. Could be made smaller because this toolchain is using uh, glibc. So if we were building a uselibc toolchain, we could probably reduce it to be like two megs or maybe even less than two megs uncompressed. And then you need to adjust your kernel configuration. So I'm not, again, building the kernel with build root because the kernel I'm building it so many times a day that I really want to do that completely separately. And, and usually I build my, my CPIO image mostly once for all, except when I want to add more tools. So on my, on my kernel configuration side, what I do is I point the initramfs source to where build root generated the CPIO image. I ask my kernel to compress it, so arbitrarily I've chosen the gzip compression, but you could use another compression level, LZO or LZMA or whatever. I remember to enable devtmpfs so that it works properly with the build root configuration. And that's about it. I build, I build my kernel, it com directly integrates the initramfs, I boot it, and it has a built-in root file system, which I can very easily extend by changing the build root configuration. Just to mention that uh, many of those options in the kernel, if you tell build root to build your kernel, which is normally the case when you use build root to build an entire production-ready uh, build si um, Linux system, uh, build root would automatically enable those options. But in this case, we are building our kernel separately because we really want to focus on, on the development of the kernel itself. So we're not using build root to control that, the, that part of the build. Another use case is the NFS use case, uh, which is still quite useful uh, in, uh, when doing uh, kernel development. So in this case, uh, I'd recommend using the tar file system image format. And uh, so after the build, you get in output image uh, tarball, which contains the root file system. You simply need to extract it as root um, in some place, which gets exported through NFS. And then provided you have the right kernel configuration options, and you're the right kernel command line, you can tell your kernel to mount this file system over NFS. So there's nothing really build root specific here, except that you need to generate the tarball and extract it as root. Uh, some people uh, were confused by the output target directory in build root, which contains more or less what is going to be your target root file system, but in fact isn't your target root file system because the permissions and ownership are not correct. Build root does not run as root. So it cannot create the files with the right permissions and so on. So we have a little dance with fake root and make dev and a lot of some tricks to actually create a tarball that contains the right files with the right permissions and ownership. So that's really the tarball that you should use if you want the thing to work properly. Um, then you can extend your rootfs beyond, um, um, beyond just BuzzyBox. Drawbear is definitely a, a nice SSH server and client that you can bring by just adding like one red kilobyte maybe to your root file system and compressed. And build root has all those packages that I found just by looking through the available packages that I believe are useful when doing kernel development. 
So like benchmark programs, debugging tools, hardware interaction tools that I already mentioned, like I2C tools, PCI utils, and, and so on and so on. So depending on the area you're interested in, if you're more a network guy or more a, a video guy, you won't certainly use the same tools, but some of them are already available directly in, uh, in build root. And if your tool is not there, writing a, a build root package is really, really easy. It's well documented in the build root manual, so it's, it's easy. It's something that um, a slightly experienced Linux developer can do in a, like under an hour, even for the first package. So it's really damn easy. Uh, to conclude, I have two uh, configurations examples that I use. So they are really the files that I use for my day-to-day -day, um, Marvel-related ARM development. So this is the first uh, one I use uh, for most of the development. So as you can see, I select the ARM and Cortex-A8. So that's the dot .config, more or less, in some simplified way. Um, I choose an external toolchain. I choose uh, not actually just dev TMPFS, but I've enabled mdev, which is the BuzzyBox lightweight version of udev, for those who don't know. And I've selected this because I have a bunch of firmwares and when you have firmwares, you need a, a user space helper to push the, kernel, the firmware to the kernel when the device gets initialized. And as you can see, I have a bunch of firmwares here because I'm testing PCI, which has some Wi-Fi cards that need a firmware. And then I have a bunch of other tools like to test network and, and interact with wireless in network interfaces and USB utilities, PCI utilities, and so on. Just because over time, I've been using all those tools to do my kernel development. And finally, I generate a root file system image. So with all those tools, it takes uh, 5.6 megabytes uncompressed, the root file system. So it still fits quite nicely in, a, in an Intram FS. Again, the Intram FS is compressed, so it's not adding so much size to your kernel image. And it took like 30, 13 minutes to build on my laptop. It can probably be a, a lot smaller if you have a faster machine. Another variant, which I've mentioned here, because obviously, you can find ARM root file system very easily. But no, let's jump to your doing ARM beginion. Who has uh, ARM beginning distribution available or ARM beginning root file system easily available? That's not easy to find. So the fact that you can point root to a specific tool chain, in that case, it's a tool chain provided by Marvel directly. Um, I was able to generate a minimal root file system with just, in that case, just drop bare that I could integrate in the Nitram FS on my ARM beginning uh, kernels and still do my usual testing. So at the moment, I haven't had the need for more but uh, for more tools, but maybe it will increase in the future. Um, so to conclude, uh, if you need a root file system for your kernel development, well, just use uh, build root. Questions? Yeah, please. I um, guess we have a mic over here. Is this one still? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it works. Uh, do you have a way to embed uh, kernel modules inside the root FS? Yes, we do have a way um, to do that when um, build root is responsible for building the kernel, uh, because obviously in that case it takes care of building the kernel and then the modules are installed in the right place and then part of the root file system image. However, when doing kernel development where the kernel is built separately, there is no such mechanism. You would have to manually like take your modules, put them in the Intram FS, regenerate it, and then in rebuild again your kernel to integrate your Intram FS within it which I think it's, is rather cumbersome, so I, I just do everything statically compiled for the drivers I care about when doing development. And I can build them later as modules if, if that's really what I want, but during development I just build everything statically. Other questions? Yeah. Um, I have a small question regarding uh, firmware lo loading. Uh, I thought the kernel was able to do the firmware loading uh, by itself since uh, 3.7, I think? Uh, maybe. If I am correct, <laughs> uh, there is an internal f uh, mechanism in the kernel to load the firmware, and if it can't find the firmware, it will re revert to running a user space helper. Okay, I wasn't aware of that. Nice to, nice to learn. Okay. Other questions or comments? Yeah, there are two, 45 seconds left. Do you use a CKH to compile? Yeah, we, we do have CKH support. Mm. 
For such small root file systems, I don't think it's really, really mm. necessary because the build time is really small, but we do have CKH support. Mm. Is it easy to link uh, build root and uh, cross tool ng? Yeah, absolutely. Um, w whichever tool chain you generate with cross tool ng, you can use it within build root. It's one of the the external tool chain provider that we test uh, regularly, and uh, it's definitely some something even that we recommend if your tool chain is not like readily available uh, from like Linaro or other other parties. Um, the best way of generating a tool chain is definitely a cross tool ng, and so we support that. Other questions? Time is over, so I believe that I will just thank you for your attention. Thank you, Thomas.